Hey everyone, and welcome back. I hope you've had a wonderful summer and you feel nice and relaxed and ready for the new season. Personally, I have to say I am more than ready for autumn. Summer's been quite long and a little hot around here. I really enjoyed my vacation though and I've brought back this beautiful book here from when I went to Graz at the start of August. I bought it at the museum shop, not here, um, I visited the Landeszeug house which I can really recommend, it was great. I went to the Kunsthaus and they have this really big museum shop with plenty of books and tons and tons of like novelty items which are all really cute but here with this one I thought I just had to take it to share it with you it's a book on the Voynich manuscript which you might have heard of, it's quite a well-known mystery from the Middle Ages. So, what is this manuscript? It's a codex, so like an old form of a book handwritten on parchment or vellum to be exact it's made from calf skin and there are about 240 pages with these illustrations of plants and uh, star constellations and some pages are just filled with text in the script you can see here so I just quickly want to show you what the actual book looks like this is the cover looks pretty simple, nothing um, too impressive if you found that in the library. It's not the original cover so we don't really know what it looked like but there are some traces of insects on the first pages that give us a clue that it was a different material originally. And here you can see the book from the side and you can see that some of the pages are folded so you can open them uh, once, sometimes twice or three times Vellum was regularly used before the invention of the printing press and it was quite high quality compared to parchment you can make parchment from pretty much any animal skin but this one is usually a bit smoother, a bit better to write on and the Voynich manuscript is made from something like 10 to 15 entire calf skins, so it wasn't cheap. The interesting thing about this book is that we don't know when it was created or where, who the author is and maybe even more mysteriously if you look at this text it looks like it 
there should be something that's understandable, that maybe it's just an old script that we don't know. But you should be able to decipher it if you know the language and get used to the script. But it's been a couple hundred years now and no one has been able to crack this code. It is entirely a mystery. In fact, we don't even know if this is really a language, if it's actually a text that makes sense, or whether it's, you know, just invented, just a nonsense that is made to look like an actual text. The illustrations aren't really helpful either. You can see here it says botanical parts. Since we can't understand the text, the book is usually divided by um, what we think the illustrations mean. So we have a botanical part, then uh, let's see, a cosmological part, biological part here. There are some rosettas which we'll go which we'll get back to in a bit. A pharmaceutical part and in the end the theory is that these are recipes. So if we look at the first couple pages here, we can see that there are plenty of different plants. They are depicted with the flowers, the leaves, stems and the root system. This one here only has leaves but no flowers. They are green with some red marks here and some dots on the white leaves. If you look at the colors, the greens and reds are still really vibrant. So that stands out too. Here's another strange plant with this large dark blue bulb here. You know, it could be almost like a sunflower, but I've never seen anything like this. Maybe like a poppy. Then we have leaves in this strange form. Almost like little legs poking out. Plant. It looks like it is curling in on itself, like a balloon skirt. And the roots form these bulbs here at the end. And if you're thinking at this point, you've never seen a plant like any of these before, then you're probably right. 
Very, very few of these have been identified. Some look they, like they might have been mixed together, like maybe the flower heads taken from one plant, the leaves from another, and the roots from a third one. But everything's a bit of a mystery. It doesn't quite make sense. This one here is really strange too. Maybe the plant's been cut off at some point. And then these are new spreads. We don't really know. And the roots kind of form a knot around themselves. But you're probably wondering, how come we don't know anything about this book? Where is it from? Someone must have found it at some point. The name, Voynich, is taken from Wilfred Voynich, who bought it in 1912 in Italy at the Villa Mondragone. It was sold by the Jesuit order. They were short on funds, so they selected some of the manuscripts from their library with the intention to sell them back to the Vatican. But about 30 of those manuscripts landed in different hands, and Alfred Voynich got some among them. This one here. Alfred Voynich himself was um, at this point, he was an antiquarian, he dealt with old books, but before that, he was a revolutionary, uh, born in, what is today, Lithuania. He became a licensed pharmacist uh, with a degree from the University of Moscow. But because of his revolutionary activities, he was imprisoned in Siberia. He fled, made it to London. He married uh, his wife Ethel, an author. And eventually he moved to New York. He spent his life trying to decipher this strange manuscript, but without any success. And when he died, his wife Ethel inherited it. She left the book to a friend of hers in 1960, who then in turn sold it to um, a rare book dealer, Hans Peter Kraus, who incidentally was from my home country, from Austria. But he lived in the US at this point. And when he too couldn't find anyone that wanted to buy the book, he donated it to the Yale University, where it still is today. Attached to the manuscript was a letter when Voynich bought it. A letter that was addressed to Athanasius Kircha, a 17th century scholar. He was a Jesuit um, and sometimes compared to Leonardo da Vinci because he had a really broad range of interests. He was very knowledgeable and the owner at the time, Johannes Marcus Marzi of Kronland, he hoped that maybe Athanasius Kircher would be the one who would be able to crack the code and decipher the text. So here's what he wrote. Reverend and distinguished sir, father in Christ, the book, 
bequeathed to me by an intimate friend, a destined for you, my very dear Athanasius, as soon as it came into my possession, for I was convinced it could be read by no one except yourself. The former owner of this book asked your opinion by letter, copying and sending you a portion of the book from which he believed you would be able to read the remainder, but he at the time refused to send the book itself. To its deciphering, he devotes his unflagging toil, as is apparent from attempts of which I send you herewith, and he relinquished hope only with his life. But his toil was in vain, for such sphinxes as these obey no one but their master, Kircher. Except now this token, such as it is, and long overdue though it may be, of my affection for you, and burst through its bars, if there are any with your wonted success. Dr. Raphael, a tutor in the Bohemian language to Ferdinand III, then King of Bohemia, told me the sad book belonged to the Emperor Rudolf, and that he presented to the bearer who brought him the book 600 ducats. He believed that the author was Roger Bacon, the Englishman. On this point I suspend judgment. It is your place to define for us what view we should take thereon, for those for whose favour and kindness I unreservedly commit myself and remain at the command of your reverence, Johannes Marcus Marzi of Grunland, Prague, 19th of August, 1665, or maybe it was 1666, that part is hard to decipher. So, what do we learn from this? The book was owned by someone beforehand and uh, there was Georg Baresch, who was an alchemist in Prague. He actually wrote to Athanasius Kircher. Um, Kircher was teaching at the Collegio Romano, the Jesuit college in Italy. And Athanasius wanted to buy the book but, um, as we learn here, Georg Barish refused. He wanted to keep it, he just sent a bit. And the reason he believed that Athanasius Kircher would be able to translate it is because Kircher claimed to have deciphered the Egyptian language from hieroglyphs. That was not actually the case, we now know that his translations weren't correct, but he made a connection between the Coptic language and the old Egyptian language, which really helped um, with later attempts at translations. This Johannes Marcus Marzi, or as sometimes it's written Marek Marzi, was a rector at the University of Prague, so also a very educated man. We read here that it was sold to Emperor Rudolf. That would be Rudolf II, the Habsburg Emperor who didn't reign from Vienna, but rather from Prague. I've talked a little bit about that before. And he was very interested in science, in alchemy, uh, probably also a little bit in the occult, and put together a Wunderkammer. It's like a cabinet of curiosities. We can think of that as an ancestor of our modern museums. A lot of collections started as a form of Wunderkammer, where just a lot of things came together. Uh, scientific instruments, manuscripts, art, um, precious stones, pretty much anything. So, it makes sense to think that Rudolf would have been interested in a book like this. And there is a note in his records that says that he bought some rare or remarkable books for 600 florins from someone called Karl Wiedemann in 1599. Whether it was this manuscript, however, isn't certain. 
It might be so. Karl Wiedemann was a collector of manuscripts himself, and he was a secretary of Edward Kelly, who was an alchemist at the court of Rudolf. So you can see that it kind of all comes together at the court of Rudolf II. And and here he says he believed that the author was Roger Bacon, the Englishman. At this point, I suspend judgment. We kind of get an idea that uh, Johannes doesn't really believe that himself, or he's a bit unsure. In fact, this was disproven um, quite certainly. So Roger Bacon was probably not behind the manuscript. It was also thought that maybe Edward Kelly created it, or maybe John Dee, um, but that's all rather unlikely. We don't know so who owned it beforehand, so we're not entirely sure that it was in Prague, so it's likely, but we don't know how it got there and where it came from. It was only somewhat recently, in the last couple of years, that the parchment was dated um, to the first half of the 15th century. And when the ink and the colors were looked at, they are consistent with that time period. So, of course, it could be a hoax that was created later, but it's quite likely that it was created in the first half of the 15th century, so it really is a medieval manuscript. One aspect that makes it quite unlikely that this is a hoax from much later is that this kind of parchment would not have been preserved. Uh, it would be very, very difficult to find 15 calf skins of the size and quality that you could create a fake manuscript with. So, there's an idea. It's from the late Middle Ages. And then there's one little detail in the book that gives us an idea where it might have been created. And that's here at the Rosetta pages that I mentioned earlier. So let's put the letter aside again. This is a bit strange as well. Uh, these are pages that can be folded. You can see the lines here in the parchment. As well as over here. The assumption is that these are a map of sorts with the connections in between the rosettas, but I'm not quite sure what kind of map that might be, whether these would be Maybe rivers or oceans, maybe with a land in the middle, I'm not sure. However, here is one small building. I'll just turn this over so you can see it. We can see what looks like a medieval fortress with a tower here and there's a fortification, a wall in the front and have a look how this wall is built In the early 15th century there was only one place in Europe where these types of walls existed and there was in northern Italy. 
They were used elsewhere later as well, but during that time frame, was only used in northern Italy. So it's quite likely that the manuscript was created you know, somewhere between Milan and Venice, but we don't know where exactly. So that's the history we know. It's probably from northern Italy, from the late medieval period. It probably came to Prague when Rudolf II ruled there and eventually was given to Athanasius Kircher, who brought it to the Collegio Romano where it remained for about 200 years until it was moved to a different library and eventually sold by the Jesuits and Wilfred Voynich picked it up The purpose of it is difficult to determine One thought is that the purpose of it was to provide pharmaceutical information. In the Middle Ages, you used a lot of herbs for medicine. And the thought at the time was that you also had to know your horoscope or the position of the stars in order for medicine to work properly. So that gives us an idea of why these sets of illustrations were chosen. In fact, the plants that we see here are parts that are also present in the earlier botanical section. So that might make sense. But then again, what's up with the text? Why does it not make sense? There are different theories when it comes to the text. One, of course, is that it's written in some kind of cipher, but no one's been able to decode it. Statistically, it is likely that it's a natural language and not just the mix of words. People also notice that there are differences in vocabulary, so to say, from one section to another, indicating that there's you know, different words are used to describe different um, elements. It might be written in a constructed language. However, the constructed languages that we know of were created after the period when this was written. One interesting theory is that it might have been written in a sort of trance state that maybe someone was, so to say, speaking in tongues or writing a stream of consciousness. It was uh, compared to some drawings that Hildegard von Bingen did when she suffered from migraines and they saw some similarities. But that's difficult to prove or disprove could be that it was written by someone with neurological issues uh, who managed to write like this. But then again, this doesn't look like a cheap book that was created for fun. It's of course possible that it's a hoax that was written in order to sell it to someone rich who would be interested in this. Um, if it had been written later, for example, by Edward Kelly or John Dee, you know, it might make sense to think that they wanted to sell it to Rudolf II, who obviously had a lot of funds, who was interested in these kinds of strange manuscripts, anything to do with alchemy, anything mysterious. But I don't think anyone 
uh, created this thinking that in a hundred years or later they could sell it expensively so we are left with a mystery if you look through YouTube there are plenty of um, videos where people claim that they've solved the mystery and articles pop up like every year where people say ah they found the code they know what it says but nothing's been proven so far and I think that's a really uncomfortable place to be you're looking at this wonderful book with all of these pages and there's no explanation that's not something we like as humans to be left with this kind of uncertainty there is one way of looking at it though that I really like in the 1970s an Italian artist, Luigi Serafini, created a similar codex, the Codex Serafinius, written in a strange language that doesn't make any sense, filled with images that are hard to decipher. And he said the goal was that when you look at it you can feel like a child again looking through a book that you can't read or understand yet where everything is still new and something to marvel at Maybe that's a way to appreciate the uncertainty that we see in this book. To just accept it as it is. To look at the strangeness of it. And know that it's just not for us. Whoever made this obviously put a lot of thought into it, but we are not the ones who share this knowledge and that's all right of this book for today. I hope you enjoyed this little mystery. Thank you for watching. I wish you a good night and I'll see you again next week. Until then.